Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Rob De Shooter. Rob is the co-founder of the Belgian Eco Modernist and a committed activist who's currently working on founding a cross-European movement of eco modernists and eco pragmatists. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Chris. So uh, that was a pretty brief intro, Rob. I, I do understand that this interview was a little tenuous because um, I think you have your third baby on the way. Um, it is possible you That's might have right. to get up out of that chair <laughs> and, and jump in the car and, and drive your wife to the hospital. But um, exactly. you're an activist, a father. Tell, tell me a little bit more about yourself. Um, today we're talking about the Belgian nuclear phase out. Um, and so maybe how did you come to be concerned about that? And how did you come to be involved in, in the activism that you're engaged with? Yeah. Um, well, I think I was been, I've been, uh, politically active, um, and onto various activist causes since I was like a student. So, um, I, I was an activist in the um, anti-globalist movement back then. So, um, not thinking about nuclear or energy at all. Um, and through the years, um, being involved in various uh, deep green movements, um, I got, I got, uh, thinking about more and more about energy, agriculture and stuff like that. And, um, the late, late, lately, um, having discussions, people were starting to call me an eco modernist. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, what's that? And I rolled into that one. Uh, and, um, we got, we got together and we're, we're actually building this thing right now. So, um, now you, <laughs> that's how when that you, when you say we're a uh, deep green, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, there's, it's really important to find labels to, to accurately describe ourselves and sure. describe, I don't just want to say our opponents, but you know, other people in the environmentalist debate. Um, so deep green is referring to more sort of like a, a degrowth. Um, well, I, I suppose it's a tra traditional okay. green, uh, the word deep, degrowth wasn't very popular 20 years ago right. but uh you know the the usual okay. stuff like do less have have less people right. whatever right so, okay. so kind of class, so. classic green yeah because there's, there's a movie that came out a little while called the classic green uh, yeah. called bright green lies and it's it's contrasting bright green and, and deep green bright green meaning kind of corporate environmentalism the renewables lobby etc um and that's being critiqued sure. by people who yeah. call themselves deep green folks like this apocalyptic uh, Derek Jensen character who thinks we should, you know, blow up all of our hydro dams and free the rivers and that, you know, human population should be reduced to, you know, a few hundred thousand or something to restore the balance of the earth. So there's, there's like, there's so many labels, but anyway, let's, let's not go too down that rabbit hole. Suffice it to say, <laughs> exactly. You, you sort of drifted into eco modernism. I'm really excited about um, the second part of your introduction there, um, which is that you're involved in, in organizing a sort of cross European movement of, Eco pragmatists, uh, eco modernists. I'm not sure what phrase you guys use to describe yourselves. I've been really, um, kind of excited in, in talking to, um, Europeans, uh, who are involved in, in, in those kind of movements because I sense that there's, um, something a little different about European, um, however we're going to call them, however we're going to label them, eco modernists, eco pragmatists. Uh, exactly. it's a little bit different than, than sort of yeah. what I see coming out of, um, California. No disrespect to the Breakthrough Institute or others, but, um, there tends to be a little bit more of a, um, maybe kind of an arch pragmatism and sort of working within the political realities of the U.S. Um, you know, a little bit more of a willingness to sort of, um, you know, I guess be, be a little less radical and, and just because of the, the political, gestalt of the u.s that tends to be you know much more based in um you know neoliberal economics um and an acceptance of of kind of where things are at in, in the u.s which is a bit different than europe you guys still have i think a fairly robust social democratic base so i'm, I'm just interested in in what what this sort of budding pan-european movement you're building looks like yeah uh well um i would say Getting to know a lot of people from, um, like Finland, Sweden, uh, some in UK, some in France, uh, even some in Germany, um, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands. Uh, I, I was starting to get the sense that eco modernism, uh, uh, in the, in, in Europe really has a different flavor than, uh, the American, uh, one, uh, than the American does. So, um, uh, yeah, we're, 
we're building bridges across the national um, borders, basically. And there's all kinds of people calling themselves like eco pragmatists or eco progressives, uh, eco uh, eco modernists. Still, so we're not sure about what label we need, or maybe we don't even need a label. Um, but yeah, we're trying to build this movement because it's quite um, necessary. Uh, to have like weight on the EU level because all our, all our, all the matters that we find important, like energy, obviously, and agriculture, they're tied up in EU politics. Um, so we need to, to have some weight on that level. And that's why we're building this, uh, cobbling this network together from, uh, uh people from all across Europe. And what's remarkable is, is really how aligned we are in our views about, uh, how we can progress towards a better world. It's, I'm not going to label it left or right, but I would say it's at least very progressive. Sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. So zooming in, um, from that European context to Belgium, I mean, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I think Belgium illustrates it's, it's hard to sort of, I think, take the cake or the prize for, um, for green hypocrisy <laughs> or green sort of climate vandalism, or I sometimes call it green, like own goals, like in, in soccer. Um, but Belgium is moving to rapidly phase out its nuclear fleet. Um, I believe by 2025, that's going to knock off 50% of all electricity generation and I think almost all the clean electricity. Um, and it's, you know, being pursued, I guess, because of that primary green commitment to anti-nuclearism um and that's completely overriding exactly. climate concerns so that's that's why i really wanted to 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 talk to you and learn a bit, a bit more about you know the the nitty-gritty and the backstory as to as to why that's happening so i've kind of summarized it but if you want to talk a little bit more about what the stakes are of of you know what belgium is planning and then we can get in i think to a little bit of the the history and the politics behind that sure well what the stakes are is um uh, we, we got a new government. Uh, it took us a long time. That's pl pretty classical Belgium. Uh, so it took us a year and a half of coalition forming. And right at the end, uh, the Greens got into the coalition and the Greens main, um, uh, prize to take home was we were going to finally, uh, push through the nuclear exit law. The nuclear exit law has been on the book since 2003, the last time the Greens were in government. Um, but yeah, now they're pushing through with, on that one. And so they, they won like the, the kind of energy cabinet post in these, in these coalition negotiations or okay. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, there's lots of the different parties. So we, we have, uh, parties across the two, um, uh, I'm uh, language borders, basically uh, the French side and the Dutch side. Uh, so there's all these little parties, uh, that have to form one coalition government and, um, they all have their own issues like pensions for the socialists or, uh, free market stuff for liberals. And, and they're in there. And then the greens, they say we want energy and they're right to claim that post because it's basically the most important post for the future. And, uh, they got their in green energy minister, Tina van der Brande, and, uh, she's pushing through the classic green stance on we need to close nuclear before anything else. So j just briefly, because this was of interest to me, um, I was starting to think about Belgium as the, the Lebanon of Europe, not because it's, um, <laughs> I mean, Lebanon's in rough shape right now. Don't get me wrong there, but just that you, you have this, <laughs> uh, kind of ethnically divided country. And I think does the, the, the government requires a certain representation of French and Flemish uh, representation. I'm not sure if you need like a French president and a, and a uh, Flemish prime minister, like the, in the way that, that Lebanon does. But does that complicate this kind of coalition building and make uh, governance a little more messy or does it make it more democratic? Like what's what's your feeling? Oh no, it's, it's terribly, it's terribly messy. Basically we're, yeah, we're like two countries that have to form one government because there's like the media, the press is Dutch on one side and, and, and French on the other side. So we don't talk to each other. We don't talk to each other politically, not in the public realm. So, and when we, when they have to get together and form a government, that's yes, that's messy. Um, because they have completely different issues on their mind. Uh, when they have to form coalitions and that's why it takes over, well, the last one took over a year and a half. So 
it, we we broke a world record and we broke our own <laughs> record once again. So yeah, yeah, no, I mean it's uh, it's interesting in Canada. There's been a move towards proportional representation because we have this sort of first past the post thing, winner takes all, and it's it's very undemocratic because there's regions of our country that maybe are very politically conservative, and you'll it doesn't matter if you have a progressive vote there; it's not going to mean anything. Um, and I, I'm certainly, I think broadly in favor of, of some form of proportional representation, but there are dangers and, uh, you know, the greens kind of jumping in at the end and getting to wield so much power is, is very interesting to me. Um, tell me a little bit about, um, this nuclear exit law. It sounds, it sounds a bit like, uh, the German energy vendor or the atom. atom yeah. It's whatever. the same yeah. thing basically. Yeah. The same context. Atomage tic. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Uh, yeah. Well, um, so in 1999, we had another, we had also elections, uh, federal elections. And, um, back then there was a dioxin crisis and this basically gave the Greens a bit of a push. So they won the elections. Uh, I historically strongly, uh, um, back then, um, I think they reached about 10%. And what, what was the dioxin uh, So they crisis? were part of the, um, it's, it was a crisis of food contamination, food for, uh, ch chicken feed and I think also pig feed. And there was the worry that these dioxins, uh, would cause cancer across the population. Uh, so yeah, that, that was, um, kind of bad for the government that we had gotcha. back then. Uh, I, th and so that gave the Greens a bit of a, uplift for caring about environment and about these issues. So uh, that's why they got into government back uh, when the elections came around. Uh, and so, yeah, um, all, already then they were focused on uh, getting nuclear plants uh, out of the picture and uh, their main um, concern, uh, their coal in the coalition proceedings, they were focusing again on, getting uh, a nuclear exit law on the books and they got it by the end of the uh, tenure of that government in 2003. Um, and since then we've been basically meandering along, um, postponing this exit uh, until now the Greens are back in government and they're no, no longer about postponing the exits. Right. So th this is like a, you know, it's interesting. It's you know, in, the, in the setting of climate legislation as well. It's it's very easy for politicians to pass laws and make promises, um, use their words. But I mean, this is one half uh, of Belgium's electricity generation is nuclear. Um, this has huge yeah. implications um, for the country, um, for the grid. You know, and, and the grid underpinning the rest of you know the networks of a country or of that society the lifeblood of civilization you know as as folks like robert bryce uh talk about in in their uh their books and, and movies um this is really yeah. significant so i mean it makes sense that it was sort of passed and then sort of sat there on the books gathering dust uh because it's it's a major endeavor to transition energy and and to do so in such a drastic form so um yeah. So how is that being received? How, how, how quickly are, you know, from the Greens getting into government and putting this agenda back on the issue is, is the plan to get rid of nuclear? Is it, is it, um, proceeding along as, as quickly as planned or meeting more delays? So, so yeah, by now, the, the right now, the, the nuclear exit law says 2025, everything has to be closed. Okay. Um, so, and that's, yeah, what they're aiming for. And it's, I think it's going to happen probably, uh, barring some miracle, but, um, yeah, that's, that's the, the aim and that's what they'll probably get as well. All right. So it begs uh, the question, what, what's the plan? Um, how are they going to replace these reactors? The, uh, the plan is to build new gas plants. Um, uh, we, we currently have, uh, like, I think it's about, 10% from wind and then um, a smaller percentage from uh, solar. I mean, that's not really big here in a great country like us. And then the, the, the rest of it, the bulk of it is natural gas right now already. And we're going to close the plants and build new gas plants to replace them. And I understand there's... Um... Like because of that, Belgium would be the only country in the EU who would see its emissions rise in the next 
decades or next few years? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Of course, that's pretty significant. If you shut down your main low carbon source, um, then you're going to see rising CO2 and that's what we're doing. So yeah, we're going to be the worst, uh, kid in school, uh, doing that. I was, uh, I was talking to Caleb Kalametz, um, about carbon pricing in the, in the EU, um, and, and that this is going to have a larger and larger impact in his opinion on, on shifting the, uh, the balance back towards nuclear, but the price of carbon is getting very expensive and the price of gas. Um, my recent interview with Mark Nelson on this topic, um, is, is skyrocketing. Um, is that giving pause to anyone? Is that getting any play in the media? Is that being discussed in the context of, of the planned nuclear phase out and the, the kind of gas build that's required or no? Yeah, it's getting more and more attention. So, uh, seeing, seeing all the prices rise very significantly, uh, is probably going to give pause to, uh, perhaps not the green politicians, but the, all the other ones, uh, who basically haven't done much to stop the nuclear exit. They could have done that when the greens were out of power. Um, but they didn't. So it's even the onus is also on them. It's not just on the greens. Um, but yeah, um, I think we're, some of them might be getting cold feet from uh, looking at the current gas prices, uh, rallying. Uh, and also, yeah, obviously, uh, the ETS, uh, European, uh, European trade emissions system. So that's also going up. It's not going to come down. So we can only expect to see rising prices if we rely on gas. Interesting. So, um, let's, let's talk a bit more again about, about this Belgian context. Um, I, I, we, in our sure. pre-talk, you were telling me something interesting about, you know, who owns and operates all the, the nuclear plants. Um, you know, share that with our listeners. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, Belgium is slightly special in the sense that, uh, we never had a national build out. It was also, uh, it was always a private, uh, venture. Um, we basically, uh, started building plants. I think we built a, a research reactor somewhere in the fifties. And then, uh, we built plants in the seventies based on, um, the Westinghouse reactor, the, so the PWR. So they were all always in private hands, uh, um, uh, basically big com companies, conglomerates, um, uh, building these things and selling electricity and, um, going through history is they've been owned by, um, different companies and those companies have fused together. And in the end, they were bought by f a big French company, GDF Suez, uh, which is now known as NG. And in Belgium, we call it Electrabel. So NG Electrabel is basically the owner of the plants right now. And one of the things that was always used against nuclear is because it's a monopoly from one big French company, right. which is true. And this is also a predominantly a gas company in France. Is that not right? Yeah. NG, NG is actually, yeah, you, you got NG and you got the EDF in mm -hmm. France and NG is basically the gas company. So either way, they're pretty happy in the Belgian situation. They're going to build either gas plants or keep nuclear open. Um, so they can't really lose in this situation. And, um, in terms of, um, like financing these, uh, these, these gas plants that Belgium is planning on bringing online. Um, is that an easy thing to do in the context of the overall, um, you know, European commitment to decarbonization? Um, is that legislatively easy to get that financing? Like you hear all around the world about, um, you know, a divestment from, from new fossil fuel infrastructure, particularly, um, and you hear mm -hmm. a lot about, um, you know, European banks, not funding fossil fuel infrastructure development um in the developing world um so what's what's going on there who's who's gonna who's gonna pay for for these new plants what are the mechanisms involved yeah so um well it was pretty obvious that no operator was going to build gas plants because they're not viable uh in the current uh situation so the idea um uh, the idea proposed was to build, uh, to, to, um, have some sort of subsidy system. Um, it's called, uh, capacity, capacity remuneration mechanism. 
um, CRM in short. Um, basically it, uh, pays plants to provide capacity, uh, even if they don't, uh, run. Uh, so, so the, the idea is to sell it as, well, we're not going to run them, but we're going to pay them to be there in case we need them. Um, so that's, uh, what's happening right now was the CRM was approved. It was approved here in the federal, uh, at the federal level, but it was also approved now recently at the EU level. Um, so we got approval to basically subsidize gas plants. And, um, I think it's the end of, or the beginning of October, we'll have uh, an auction for new operators that want to build gas plants across Belgium, um, to, uh, to auction, um, a position and 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 um, be be um, uh, able to receive these funds, these subsidies. Is there any outcry against that? Is that uh, how is gas? How is gas? Yeah, perceived? I'm I'm, I'm crying <laughs> out against yeah. that. So yeah, uh, there's a bunch of us. There's uh, people are doing stand up for nuclear. Obviously, the ecomodernists in Belgium. So yes, we are crying out against that. Um. But it's not the main. Like, I like mean, even it's in, not in the mainstream media enough. So. In Germany, you see this tension where there's the the nuclear phase out. Um, you know where they? I think they brought a new a new uh, modern coal plant online recently. Um, Datteln four, I think. But you know, there's there's protests, right? I mean, the Greens are yeah. going out and they're um, trying to occupy the lignite, you know, strip mines, and you know, there there's a, a fairly healthy protest movement. I think it's you know based on the premise that the government just needs to build even more renewables, and, and that's the way, and that they're not committed enough. But like, are there elements of the Greens that are wanting to protest these gas plants, or gas plants are what like a necessary evil? Yeah, or? there's a there's a few. Yeah, exactly. There's a few activist groups, but they're basically now shunned by the, by the classic greens, uh, for, for being against gas because the greens realize that it's either gas or nuclear. And, um, anyone who protests gas plants is basically prolonging the life of nuclear. So, um, they are the, the, the really anti act, the anti gas activists are also being uh shunned by the classic green um ideology so um but there's plenty of pl pro local protests and they also have some uh they filed some legal um complaints against the procedure so they might be uh they might be winning uh, a few of those cases so yeah that's that's at least positive to see that there are still greens even though they're from the I guess the grill side that uh, think what they're doing is wrong right and, now. And how, so how is the, the but it's not the majority. Yeah, how, how does, how, what's sorry, the, in terms of the messaging of the, the green establishment or the green party, or I forget her name, Tin, um, how, how did, Tin van der Straat. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to attempt yes. that, but I'll, I'll just call her Tin. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, so her, her, um, <laughs> how does she sell that, that vision then? How does she, like, again, cause to, to an outsider, this just looks like such, such a glaring, especially to a pro nuclear outsider, such glaring hypocrisy. And, you know, again, perhaps the, the single most, uh, flagrant example of, of greens, um, shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. Well, the there's some. So, so how, how does she, how does <laughs> yeah, she justify some, uh... the gas plant build up? There's a few ar arguments that they always put forward. Um, uh, so, somewhat gaslighting uh, the public perception, no pun intended there. Um, and the the main one is like they call it the the pixel argument. So the phase out of nuclear is only a small pixel in the total picture of the energy uh, uh, transition that we need to make. And of course, if you look far, I mean, if you if you zoom out far enough, then you, you're looking at industrial and, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, mobility. So oil. And if you look at the primary energy use, of course, you're going to reduce the significance of uh, nuclear in that, in that picture. So that the zooming out is the one argument, um, that they use. The other argument, uh, that they use is ETS. So the emission straight system. Uh, and basically the argument is, uh, we are going to build gas plants. And because of that, we're going to be pushing out coal plants in, in Poland. Now, even if that were the case, um, 
it's not a very social thing to do. I mean, it's more of a free rider uh, kind of thing to do. But uh, uh, well, yeah, we've researched this uh, issue and it turns out that our uh, impact on the ETS system isn't big enough. There's, call it uh, the, uh, basically the waterbed effect. Um, our impact isn't big enough to have effects across Europe. So we're not going to be pushing out coal. Um, and we are, in fact, just going to be emitting more uh, CO2. Um, so that's not really a valid argument. And then the classic arguments, obviously. So what about the nuclear waste? Um and safety, etc. So those have, have never really left uh, the building. So when it comes to to safety um, and that argument, um, so these reactors, they're sure. like American style Westinghouse uh, pressurized water reactors. Um, they're built in, you said, seventies, eighties. Um, what's the perception there? I mean, yeah. I've, I've heard about uh, the the scandal of the cracked reactors. Um, what, what's going on? Are these reactors that can be relicensed and you know live into their sixties or eighties as they are in the states, or is there something special about Belgium in that regard? No, there's they're, they're the same reactors. So um, this the same uh, pressurized water reactor system. Um, the cracked, the cracked issue is basic, was basically hijacked by Greenpeace and a lot. Um, so back in the, I don't know the, the, the exact date, I think the nineties, they researched these reactor vessels and they had more precise and, uh, and, uh, measure, measuring instruments and they found little, uh, bubbles basically. Um, and this story got it. Well, well, of course the greens took this as, okay, we're going to, we're going to say these aren't no longer safe because there's cracks in them, but it turns out they were there from the beginning, from the creation of the reactor vessel. And, uh, they've run thorough tests on this, uh, on these vessels and on, on uh, like, uh, materials that they've been, uh, keeping since the creation of those vessels and they can blast um, radiation onto them and see how they react. And basically they've been uh, considered completely safe in that regard. But of course this story got its, I mean, they're called the Churches reactor, which means a, a, a tear reactor, teared reactor. And this mental image is just so overwhelming in the public perception that it's very hard to get rid of, even though it's a complete bullshit, really. Um, but yeah, that's, that's two out of seven reactors that are politically unviable to keep, uh, pr to keep online, even though technically it's the same thing as the other ones. So to be clear, this isn't like a, a physical macroscopic crack you can look at. These are, these are little hydrogen bubbles or something within the steel or. Yeah, 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 yeah. You need, you need my microscopes to study, <laughs> study them. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, and as the, as the regular raised concern about this, or this is again, just a, I mean, it's very potent, that idea of a, of a, you know, a cracked reactor, things can leak out. You think about it, you think about exactly. an eggshell or yeah. something like it's, it's a brilliant little piece of propaganda. I'm scared. <laughs> it is, it is. So yeah, I don't know whether we'll be able to turn the tide on that framing, right. but, um, in, in any case, it's, it's there and it's hard to get rid of. Um, and that basically boil, uh, levels, uh, whittles down the reactors that we can keep online to two mm -hmm. instead of all seven. Um, the, the, the two youngest ones are, are too old, uh, basically. So we can't keep them aligned. That's two times 400 megawatts. And then the other ones, we could have a debate on what we need technically to, to have them online, um, for longer still. But yeah, the debate is past. Basically the greens are in power and we're not having this debate right. anymore. So there's, there's kind of two concepts that I found to be really interesting in thinking about, um, nuclear, renewables, energy mix, closures. Um, and one is um, this idea of like path dependency. So, I mean, there's there's been a huge investment in nuclear. That's probably why it's still on the grid, you know, even 18 years after the initial nuclear phase out bill. Um, it's, it's hard to get rid of 50% of your, your grid. Not impossible <laughs> if you have the right sort of um, ideological commitment um, and and finance. But I mean, that, that points to the second part of this, which is which is political patronage. Um, 
And you mentioned that the Belgian gas, uh, Belgian nuclear fleet is owned by a French gas company. Um, you know, in terms of patronage relationships, um, that, that companies, um, and sectors may have with the government, um, nuclear seems to sort of lack that in many places around the world. There's not a distinct nuclear industry. Um, again, often these plants are owned by utilities that also are, have significant interest in fossil fuels. So, um, one thing you did tell me earlier, though, that was interesting is that the, the Belgian nuclear fleet is, is quite profitable. It's, it's taxed quite heavily. It's used to balance the budget. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, um, um, I don't know the exact year, but we prolonged the, uh, nuclear fleet, um, I think 10, 10 years ago, but one of the, um, one of the conditions to prolong it to the operator was okay, but you have to pay a nuclear, um, rente, um, so basically a nuclear tax on your profits because you're making too much profits. Um, and, and well, the operator, um, conceded to that and that prolonged them, uh, another 10 years. So yeah. And that's still on the books as well. And, and that's going to be lost as well. I guess that source of revenue. Um, right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, about the, the, the kind of movement that's arisen about this. I remember, um, there was a, a protest at the, uh, I don't know if it's called the Dole plant. That's how it's pronounced. One of the large nuclear plants. Um, and I was, do, do. I was, I was talking to, uh, <laughs> one of my, uh, union friends here, a nuclear, um, labor union guy. And I said, Oh yeah, have you seen this protest at the dual plant? Um, it's, it's really exciting. And he was like, Oh God, not another, you know, he's assuming it was an anti-nuclear protest, but there was this, um, manifestation of, I think it was something like a thousand workers at the site and they were perfectly, it was such a like nuclear culture thing, right? Very safety oriented. They were in a parking lot. They were all <laughs> at least two meters apart in this kind of grid like pattern. Um, I'm not sure if they were holding placards, but you know, they, they had come out to, to, I guess, stand up for nuclear in their, in their own way and for their jobs. It was very interesting because we don't see a lot of, um, of, uh, I, I find I, I haven't seen a lot of activism from workers themselves. So this was maybe the most significant, uh, labor union, nuclear labor union action I'd seen. Um, so what's, what's sort of bubbling up? Um, I know this weekend there's a big event planned, but, um, in terms of your activism and others and, and labor activism, what are you seeing in terms of, uh, the Belgian situation? Yeah. So, well, I, I don't think it's very different from everywhere else. So the nuclear workforce is pretty quiet. They've, they've been basically labeled <laughs> as someone working for the bad side or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they, they, they don't really stand up for them, for the, the climate heroes that they actually are. Um, but yeah, that event was quite, uh, impressive. Uh, even though it didn't get much attention in the media again. Um, um, but yeah, um, I see, um, well, eco-modernists and eco-pragmatists getting up and defending the current nuclear f fleet because yeah, there's doesn't simply doesn't make sense to close them down in a climate perspective. Um, and then there's, um, civil, so other civil groups that are focused on nuclear specifically, uh, and, um, they're, they seem to be getting more, um, uh, uh, active, um, the last few years. So I think it's probably good. Um, and I, yeah, I, I hope to, uh, help them. Um, but I would say that, um, currently they're still not getting real. They're s still not getting attention in the media. The media, the media simply presumes that no one can be for nuclear. That's, that, that's I mean, that's the ridic ridiculous wild idea for them. And so, uh, we hope to get through the noise and, and, uh, actually have a presence that's uh, well, pro nuclear and, uh, pro, pro other things as well. But, um, yeah. Uh, Hope that no, I mean, question. one thing that I found to be interesting around the world is kind of the strange bedfellows that pro nuclear advocates keep, um, that I think most of us are quite mm. uncomfortable with. Most, most sort of eco modern types I run into sure. are probably a bit left of political center, progressive. Um, and, you know, just speaking with Angelong, uh, last week coming out of the Taiwanese, um, 
uh, context. You know, it's the sort of the Kuomintang, the, the kind of right wing or sort of ex Chinese fascists that are pro nuclear. Um, in Germany as well, I understand there's some pretty, um, repugnant right wing parties that are, um, that are pro nuclear. Is that, is that the same thing in Belgium? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you, um, how do yeah, you? Yeah, we see it. Yeah. We have a, we have a conservative party and they're the ones saying we need to prolong the plans. They were also the ones not defending the plans when they had a chance. So, I mean, it's not like they're, they're the heroes here. Um, but yeah, you, you see this, uh, right wing, uh, embrace of nuclear and that's kind of not helping always well at least it's someone but um they they're also the ones who are not that worried about climate change so it's kind of weird yeah you as you say strange bedfellows there um so i think we need to make clear that nuclear isn't a right wing uh issue it isn't uh it's it's could just as well be a left wing issue or social democ democratic issue um, but yeah, they're there, you know, the, 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 the more reactionary types, they like nuclear and I'm, sometimes I worry that they like proposing it because they know other, the other side hates right, it, right. uh, that they're not really committed to the energy question to it on its own, but they like to be reactionary. So yeah, you have those, but I see more and more um movements from the center as well so we'll have to amplify that so we we've actually um we're dispatching a, a couple of reporters um to belgium this weekend um so we're gonna okay. have some on the ground uh presence at the uh, belgian standard for nuclear event um I understand, uh, it's, it's gonna, you, I understand you're having a baby any moment, so I'm not sure how involved you are in that, but, um, mm -hmm. if you can, if you can share any, uh, in, information about the event with us, um, you know, as a little, uh, trailer, um, again, we're, we're gonna have, a, a couple reporters there, um, you know, who are gonna be doing some live streaming and, and doing some interviews. So we'll have something together for our listeners, um, about, about the Belgian situation. Um, but yeah, just maybe in closing, um, if you can, if you can tell us a little bit about, what's uh what's being planned in terms of uh this this grassroots opposition to the phase out um yeah um so the stand up for nuclear I, I basically it's a coalition across the world so um i think it's um um being organized locally here at least um in terms of getting all the permits etc by a a group of uh civil activists also focused only on nuclear um called 100 terawatt terawatt hours um so the belgian eco-modernists aren't involved in um in organizing this um but we'll probably see some eco-modernists uh from across europe there as well um practical yeah it's on saturday um that the, the stand-up event is planned between two and uh four um, well, I think, uh, you probably can refer people to the websites at standupfornuclear.be. Um, and there is going to be, um, um, interview, uh, not interviews, uh, speeches by, well, of course, uh, local organizers, but also some, uh, international uh, activists, um, that are standing up for nuclear. Okay, Rob. Well, thanks for, thanks for coming on and providing some context for that. Again, Decouple will have, um, some live and recorded coverage. Um, looking forward a lot to, uh, to seeing if anything positive comes out of this or if the media narrative is broken. I, I did hear that there's a marathon happening, um, uh, maybe on the same day or the day before the stand up for event, stand up for nuclear event. And one of the, uh, runners who's actually quite competitive will be wearing a, uh, like a little, running marathon singlet or, or tank top with the word nuclear on the back um so there is a there is a, <laughs> that might get some there attention. Is a chance that you know nuclear could win the race here um so uh sure. yeah we'll see we'll see how that comes to and we're through and we're looking forward to here at decouple to, to bringing you guys uh i guess some of our first kind of uh on the ground coverage uh you know so we're not just uh an interview driven podcast but also um you know, providing coverage. In addition, we'll, we will be at COP26 as well, uh, doing something similar. So, um, yeah, looking forward to that. Rob, again, thank you for providing us uh, some context on the, uh, the Belgian situation. No problem. Uh, bye for now.